<clears throat> before we get going on the review, just an explanation of what I mean by one to five stars on anything. One star means I don't think it's going to see play in just about anything, including whatever toolkit it's enabling. Uh, two stars means it may see some fringe play, but probably only in its toolkit. Three means this should definitely fit into its toolkit and be an auto-include anytime you're trying to do that strategy for most people, most of the time. <clears throat> Four stars means this card is great. This is always an auto-include if you're in that strategy, and sometimes an include even if you are not. And five stars means this is an auto-include if you are in that region, uh, and you're probably memeing or being foolish with your deck building if you are not auto-including it. Uh, so obviously five stars would be extremely, extremely high value. Um, for that reason alone, it is unlikely a champion will be rated at five stars because it is unlikely a champion will be, you must play this champion if you are playing this region. Um, if anyone gets uh, looks extremely broken on a, re uh, on a release and is a case of if you aren't playing this champion while you're playing this region, while you're playing the region, that would change. But for the most part, um, I don't think I will ever rate a champion higher than a four, um, specifically because I want to um, keep those definitions where they are of this should be an auto-include if you are playing the region. And champions, while really strong, are the least auto-include because of your very limited deck space for playing champions. Um, so yeah, with, uh, without further ado, I'm just going to kind of hop in. I'm going to try to do it in a logical order, but the way the file is saved is a bit weird, so if I go a little out of order, I apologize. Um, I will try to make it make sense. I am going to do um, Ruin cards and Sentinel cards kind of separately, just because I separated them that way in my folder. What I'm going to be doing is moving them into my streaming program and talking about them a little bit at a time. Um, not all the Ruin cards necessarily play in the Ruin theme, um, and same thing could be true for the Sentinel cards. I am just going to review them as they are classified and go from there. <clears throat> so let's go ahead and get our first image imprinted. Let me delete this uh, text box from last time we played. We're going to go ahead and uh, import media file. And um, since this doesn't have anything else that ties with it, we'll go ahead and just start with uh, Ruin Rex. And I'm going to get it nice and big just in case for people to be able to read it as nice as possible. All right. And what, Ru and what Ruin Rex does is, uh, is actually quite interesting. It is... Um, a new engine, sorry about um, that tab going over my thing for a second. I'm trying to get to the point where I can see my stream chat and uh, the card I'm talking about at the same time. Um, so, sorry, that's not the prettiest look. Um, I will hopefully edit it to be prettier on YouTube, but if you're watching live, sorry in advance, it's going to be a little bit messier. Uh, so anyway, Room Rex has this really cool effect. Uh, it does the cannon barrage of uh, the other Rex card in the game, but rather than go off with the plunder and being an 8-drop with a little bit more threading of a stat line, it's a 5-drop that's only a 3-3, three, three. but it's cannon barrage, which if you do not know what cannon barrage does, um, I don't think I saved the card for it, but cannon barrage um, will do 2 to a random target, and if that target is no longer in play, do 1 to the enemy nexus instead. Uh, um, it will do that a number of times equal to the amount of times you've drawn in this round up to five times. Um, for those of you who do not know, TF Fizz used to be a competitive deck. Uh, I've been fooling around with it a little bit with some of the newer cards that we just got, and it's feeling pretty competitive again. Ruin Rex could actually fit in there as a lower curve finisher than um, some of the other cards I'm currently using in the deck. Um, I don't know if it would replace a finisher or just give you a little bit more mid-game because it also just functions as a good tempo removal card to help you with your game plan. Um, but keep in mind, a lot of what TF Fizz likes to do as far as drawing goes is um, draw extra cards during their next turn. So you get to invest the mana prior to... Um, prior to needing to play the Ruin Rex and still have a fair amount of draw. Keep in mind that um, all it takes is a pick a card and starting your turn and you can play three cannon barrages on five, which would be uh, 
burn for six across random minions and or nexus or, and or one nexus damage per you know minion damage that doesn't take the two um on five plus a three a three um which is okay it's not awful it's not bad i want to draw attention to the fact that if you're able to bank some spell mana or or on more mana than five you could quite easily add a um a powder keg to this effect and by adding a powder keg you are now threatening a substantial a substantially higher number of damage and now that um um that new powder keg card is in play um set them up knock them down whatever it's called uh at the burst speed put a powder keg into play i think it's going to actually increase the overall threat potential of So Ruin Rex, uh, given the fact you can combine it with Powder Kegs, and TF is viable, I think is a playable card. I do think that it's not going to see play in a lot of decks, because there are a lot of decks where that investment of drawing cards in the previous turn isn't something you often do, because that is a opportunity advantage in cards you are putting in your deck and cards you're playing on the turn prior. For that reason, I will give this card only two stars. In TF Fizz specifically, I think this is a very strong card, but because TF Fizz has other finishers to choose from and Ruin Rex isn't always the best finisher, especially if you don't want to make more room for powder kegs, um, it makes it a fringe put into the deck, not an auto-include put into the deck. Uh, if this were able to go off more than five times in a turn, I think it would push it over the edge and make it a three or four star card, even with just that one archetype but as is um with no apparent card advantage cards that um, i've seen to help support this card outside of what's already in the game um i think some tfs decks are going to really like this i think there may be some decks i don't know about that might pop up that play the ruin rex or maybe even a deck that already exists that will play the ruin rex even as a uh, i'm happy one barrage off um but I think as a whole, it's going to be a two-star card at, at five mana. It's competing with things like Gangplank for the same faction slot. Um, and Gangplank is a more dangerous threat on average, more consistently than, than a Ruin Rex. So unless your deck is already doing what Ruin Rex wants to do, it's just not going to fit in with your overall game plans. But I am excited to try it with TF Fizz. All right, so this next card we're discussing is... Uh, Rhyme Fang Dead Mother, and in fact, let me just preemptively bring up the card that it summons because we really can't discuss it without discussing what it summons because they are intrinsically tied. I do not believe the Rhyme Fang pack is a standalone card. Yeah, there's no gem, which means it is a. Oh, let's not make it bigger than the other card, though, which means it is not summoned on its own. Um, so. Rhyme Fang Den Mother, 6 drop, 5-5. Five, five. Um, as a stat line, it's not awful. There are plenty of things that come out in 5 and 6 that are roughly that, if they aren't champions especially. Um, and you're really looking at their effect package. And this one is, is a doozy. It, uh, it really adds some incentive to playing the Ash Fra Frostbite package with lots of Frostbite again. Because um, for those of you that aren't necessarily in the loop fully, um, the Ash package just right now is most common in the package with leblanc and you play a little bit of frostbite but you're really playing ash because she's a good five attack thing on curve and that freljord has great support cards to keep your leblanc and your ash alive some of which are frostbite but a lot of which are health buffs this is potentially leading us back into a mid-range kind of control hybrid where ash is your ash is one of your win conditions and this rhyme frame den, den mother could be your other. Um, this will summon the Rhyme Fang Pack Wolf, which is a 1-1 one -one with Overwhelm, when you play it. And most importantly, this is a win summon, not when played, which means this does not go on the stack to be countered by anything. This uh, will trigger off of things that cheat your Rhyme Fang Den Mother into play from your hand or deck for some reason. Um, most notably, stating that for if more cards that cheat things come out, because... As a six drop, the cards that currently cheat cards out um, are typically going to be more expensive and not something you're going to play this for. But um, still worth just knowing for this the longevity of game design that this card is something that could become 
extremely volatile the more support it gets. Um, so anyways, this will give the Rhyme Fing pack it summons plus one, plus one for each time you have frostbitten an enemy this game. I do also want to point out that um, even if your enemies only have zero attack, when you attack with Ash, she still frostbites a target, and that will still mechanically count towards her level up and towards Rhyme Fang Den Mother's um, power increases. Uh, the only way you are not gaining stacks while doing things that trigger frostbites is if there is nothing to frostbite in play. Um, so just Ash attacking on curve, even into, you know. Uh, a Dragon Chow is still going to give you one of those Frostbites. There are plenty of Frostbite cards in the game. Um, Frostbite's a, a, a very strong effect already because most Frostbite cards are burst speed. Um, I anticipate this deck to be, which I'll go into more later because I'm going to actually do some like deck theory crafting, but I anticipate this deck to play just about every Frostbite card that is burst speed. So yes, I think the, the Run Dead Deadmother um, type deck is going to be either a TNZ to try to get extra copies, um, or with Shadow Isles to get extra copies. Either way, playing a more controlling mid-range game, um, and just trying to get as many value plays of the Rhyme Pain packs, while Ash can still be a great early mid-game finisher. Um, Rhyme Fame Den Another being a six drop is extremely reasonable to be a finisher in a game, in a deck that wants your game to play into the, uh, mid game to early late game i think that uh this card is a three star card i think it's going to be an auto include in just about any deck that is playing frostbite whether or not they're playing ash if there's a high enough ratio of frostbite in your deck uh and you have a large slot that you need filled uh to round out your curve you may just look at where your curve's at and go, okay, I have a whole lot of uh, two, three, four drops. I don't have very many five, six, seven drops. Uh, where are my finishers? You identify you only have one or two finishers or that you don't actually quite have a finisher. And it may just be that Rhyme Fang Den Mother kind of fits in as the, uh, if I am playing Frost Control, this just fits into my deck. This may actually go up to four stars depending on how good Frostbite is in the metagame. Um, but based on just what I know right now in a vacuum, on that Frostbite, Frostbite is good, but not currently insanely prevalent. I think it is a three-star card. Um, Four-star, if Frostbite is top tier, I don't think it goes down to two-star, though. I think that just about any deck that's playing more than a handful of cards that do Frostbite will be very happy to include this, even if they only include it as a one or two of. <laughs> okay, uh, next up is Scattered Pod. Scattered Pod is one of the newer releases. I actually almost didn't catch this card. Um, I don't know exactly when they announced it, but I think it would have been in the past day or so, maybe two days ago. Uh, six drop, five, six, a two. When you play it, you get to draw a spell from your deck. Uh, the only type that it currently excludes is uh, Focus Speed. Uh, there aren't a lot of Focus Speed cards that actually go into decks, though. I know there are a handful, but for the most Focus Speed... Wouldn't look... There aren't a ton of focus speed cards that go into decks, though. Most focus speed cards in the game are created. There are a handful of exceptions, and that is worth noting when you're doing deck design if you are playing this to draw a specific spell. Um, because this doesn't draw a specific cost, I could see it seeing some fringe play in a meme deck that is trying to do a very, very specific thing. The drawback to that is if you are using this to draw those meme cards, you either need to only be playing those meme spells or be playing other things to draw your spells and just this to fill the gap. Um, I um, This also has Enlightened. I have Elusive. So it has a little bit of finisher potential because a 5-6 with Elusive for 6 is actually pretty scary. Um, because of that, I am going to surprisingly give this a 3-star review. I think a lot of you are looking at this card and are giving it a one or two star review because uh, a six drop five six draw card doesn't seem very strong, but I want to point out it is an Ionia. Ionia is the faction that wants to draw through its deck for its spells, and it wants to do it as reliably as possible. 
Ionia also is the faction that plays karma that cares about enlightened. Between the two of those things, I think Scattered Pod may just have a home. This is why. Scattered Pod has six health. Six health is not a small number to get through, especially on six mana. There are some things that can get through it on six mana, but there aren't a lot, and in the format, there aren't a lot that you play on six. Um, for what I've been seeing, uh, the most consistent thing that's going to get through this card, if you play it on curve at this time, is Lurk that's just been lurking a lot. And honestly, if you're playing against a Lurk deck that is lurking a lot and you've made it to turn six and feel comfortable playing a Scattered Pod, you're actually probably in a good board state. Do I think this is going to be a three of in your deck? No, I don't. But I think a Karma deck might be happy playing this as a one of uh, just to fill out the curve a little bit. It has a tune, so functionally in a deck that plays a lot of spells that you're planning on playing spells every turn, you're pr you're probably kind of treating this as a five drop rather than a six drop most of the time. Um, you save it for enlightenment and it becomes a win condition that isn't karma that they have to answer, which is a pretty valuable thing in a karma deck. A lot of karma decks uh, are reluctant to play their karma unless they have enough cards to protect her. Scattered Pod is a kind of cool alternative. It also could bring about, um, I'm just gonna open this up for a second and uh, delete the Scattered Pod because I've already given it star rating. I can add that in in a second, uh, like, or in post edit, it will be added in prior to me doing this. I could see that actually being a way of bringing back a Dawn and Dusk finisher. Uh, and I'm not saying necessarily that that's going to be top tier in any way. By the way, for those who don't know, just for you know, fun flavor, that is the you know, corrupted version of this Cloud Drinker card right here. A little bit better stat line, um, and then its effect is a draw rather than a discount to your cards, and it actually ignores the focus. But just you know, kind of fun fact. But anyway, Dawn and Dust, if you, if you are newer to the game, um, or, you know haven't played against the random mean decks that still sometimes run this card. This card actually was an all right finisher pretty early in the set list, especially because of leveled karma. We'll play extra copies of this. Uh, obviously, Shruma now can copy a full stack. So uh, those karma extra plays are a little bit less consistent if you're up against Shruma specifically. Um, but the idea here is that this card, when you played it, when you have a level karma in play, you end up playing an extra copy, and then those extra copies all copy, and then you kind of just win by having a million karmas is normally um what you would do with it but you could play this as a one or two of in your karma deck and then have that new uh cloud unit as another target for the dawn and, dawn and dusk so you don't have to feel quite as bad if you can't stick the karma especially because you could play the karma like a turn before you hit enlightened to get the the extra um resources especially if you're attacking on odds you play you can play her on nine you can get the extra card the one time hopefully your opponent you, you got your opponent to tap on everything but you get her down uh, you get your one free spell off of her then she'll level now that she's leveled you play the new uh cloud unit in an ideal world we're, we're talking about here you, you play the new cloud unit um and then you have the rest of your mana to back up your units with double casted spells uh, likely, you're, there's going to be some crazy exchange where your opponent just concedes. But if your opponent has answers, to be some crazy exchange, and they have to choose what they prioritize. Do they prioritize, prioritize your Karma or your 5-6 Elusive? Both of which are large threats um, at that point in the game, unless they have some crazy board state. Um, you are then able to follow that up with whatever happens, even if you lose the Karma or you lose the Cloud, drink, uh, the, the cloud Unit, whichever they kill... You now have the Dawn and Dusk to play on the following turn to just say, I finish out the game. Um, will, I, will this be the best version of Karma? I don't think so. Will it be a fun version? I think it will be fun. I think people will experiment, experiment with it. I'll reiterate, I don't think the Cloud card is going to see play as more than a one or two of. I'd be very surprised if it makes a three of in any list because it is a slow card to play and it doesn't have a large enough impact. The turn you play it, unless you are playing it while it has elusive, to block an elusive unit or attack. Um, but there are karma lists that only play other champions because you need more threats. 
and it's possible that Cloud Unit can fill the role of an additional threat instead of the Karma, uh, needing to take extra champions in. And if you are combining with a faction like Freljord, where you can draw units as a specific draw power, that makes your uh, tutor cards become more consistent and makes Karma play more consistently. So I think there is a notion to use the card. I also think the card can be playable in non-Karma decks, which is why I'm giving it a 3-star rating. All right, so our next card here is Frightened Ibex, Ebex, something along those lines. Uh, yeah. Not positive exactly how it's pronounced. I'm going to call it Ibex until I hear otherwise. Um, this is quite possibly the best support, um, support, for lack of a better term, the best support that the archetype support has gotten, um, quite possibly, period, uh, for a couple of reasons. Reason number, reason number one is you can play it on one, and that is a big deal. Being able to open up with a unit that does something with support is so, so, so important. One of the issues that the support archetype kind of has is, uh, regardless of what version of the support archetype you're playing, um, there isn't a lot of stuff that proactively interacts with your support units early enough in the game. Um, or if it does, it's just not impactful enough for the timing it'll take. Because a two drop, they, there are two drops that interact with support units, but that means you're playing a two drop instead of a support unit. This will let you just play this and then curve into a unit that can support it, which is very, very important because there are plenty of two drop units that do support in the game. Uh, the most awkward thing about this is, is because this gives plus one, plus one, it does feel like more of a card that you would see in the Lulu iteration of support than the Targon um, Taric iteration. With that being said, though, um, I don't think they're as mutually exclusive as some people do. Um, yes, Lulu is a more aggressive, like, I, I smork you down type build, while um, the Targon version seems to feel a little bit more controlling, and, like, I play my buffs, and I take my time, and I go into, like, a mid to late game. But um, I think it's okay to have that overlap, where, like, this isn't in... Uh, Ionia, because that could take Ionia over the edge and leave Targon in the dust. By putting them together, even if you won't necessarily play Targ and Lulu at the same time, it gives you more incentive to make a support package still be Ionia slash Targon if you're playing support, and then you just choose which champion you're building around. Uh, I know there are support cards that aren't in those factions, because um, Damasha has one, for example. Um, but even then, I think as a whole, I really like the Frightened Ibex. Um, so let's let's actually discuss the card and give it the rating. So when I'm supported, give me and my supporting ally plus one, plus one this round. So um, on curve, let's say you play this with, um, with Ionia. You could play this, and then you play uh, your one-two elusive uh give your support unit plus one attack and a quick and quick attack um or quick attack quick strike i think it's quick attack uh sorry i'm awful with names and terminology um you should know what i mean if you're familiar with the game though you hit first when you're attacking um so ideally with this specific type of card being second um on the attack is actually pretty good for you uh you would open an attack you would have a 2-3 elusive and a 2-3 uh, plus 1, a 3-3 three, three quick attack attacking on turn 2, which is pretty nuts. And um, that obviously lends itself to the package really well. But I want to have you bear in mind that you could save this card, play it on like 3 um, before you're going to play a Taric, and use this with a Taric start giving this thing buffs, this thing becomes a threat because anything that's supporting it is getting um, buffs from it. And if it's getting buffs from Taric, then it's getting bigger and it's making your Taric harder to kill and itself harder to kill, plus the tough. Between the plus one, plus one and the tough the Taric is giving, you're basically giving a double tough, right? Because you're saying, I take one less damage from everything and that first damage I'm taking, that is health I don't actually have, th that will... Uh, 
heal at the end of the round because that was not a permanent gain to my um, my unit. So now, a terror attacking with this, both of these units have um, plus two health before you even hurt them, functionally speaking, um, with a couple exceptions of, you know, putting damage on it so you can kill it with a kill damage unit, unit type card. Um, for the most part, though, I think that this card's actually going to help Tarek a lot, too, for the reasons I just stated. Um, having something that you can consistently um, be able to play with your Tarek, uh, that your Tarek is more likely to survive swinging on the turn it is played because you have it, is extremely valuable. Uh, one of the awkward things about Tarek when I have tried him has been that you don't have a lot, have a lot of units that you necessarily want to support with him for a specific reason. You are just trying to make his thing go off so that you can win with a level Tarek and outvalue your opponent. This card is actually something that Tarek is happy to be supporting because he benefits from doing it. And I think um, if this card doesn't take support up from like a C tier to a B tier, then one or two more cards that do something similar to this on Reasonable Curve will. Um, this card is a four-star card. Um, I am not saying this card goes in every Targon deck. I'm saying this card goes in every deck that plays support and has Targon in it. And it will go in as a three of. This card is absolutely insane. I am excited to see if this is able to get support over the edge and make it good enough to see more play than it currently is. Um, Lulu's been doing really well with Shen right now, which can be awkward because she can't play this and play the Shen package. But uh, this card might be good enough to give Lulu two deck options instead of just one. Um, yeah, four-star card. Super excited about it. Um, not positive it's going to actually take support over the top. But if anything will, from what's currently been released, it is this card. <clears throat> Retired Reckoner. Uh, this is a 2-6 Overwhelm. When you target me, grant me plus 1 plus 0. Oh. So I think this might see very fringe play in a Riven deck as a 1 or 2 of to give you an extra threat that is not Riven. Because um, a lot of time... If your Riven gets answered, um, especially if you're stuck on top deck mode for whatever reason, um, you may have a handful of weapon pieces in hand that feel really awkward. And this card being able to get permanent buffs from playing weapons on it is quite strong. Uh, it also does not need the Overwhelm weapon to be played on it for it to be a threat because it already has Overwhelm. With that being said, it is understated on its initial um, cost if you are not already putting a lot of cards in your deck that are going to be able to target this into your deck, you aren't going to want to play this card. Uh, I will point out you could you know, technically use the, nox the noxious cards that burn your own units to do something, and that would increase this thing's strength because this thing only gets one strength at a time, though, and because this card um, cost five and... So really, Noxious only has two kind of expensive decks right now where they want later game stuff. There's the Otacon Bringer of Ruin deck where you're kind of trying to cheat out Otacon and win the game with Otacon. That deck isn't going to play this because this is just a mid-game card that doesn't accomplish enough. Uh, that deck wants to play cards that stall out the early and mid-game, and then you just win on late game using Otacon. The only other deck that kind of plays slower and Noxious... Um, is, sorry, um, Swain, Swain decks. Uh, and once again, Swain decks are more about targeting your opponent's stuff, not your own stuff. Uh, this could see some fringe play in Vladimir because, um, a lot of those units can target this unit with damage to give it things and so on and so forth. But keep in mind, it is competing with Vladimir on curve and Vladimir is more impactful when you play him even if he's not leveled at the time you play him. Um, I think the card is 
borderline unplayable if it weren't for the fact that the Riven Package might actually be able to use this. I would give this a one-star card. Because of the Riven Package specifically, I'm going to rate this two stars. Um, I might experiment with a deck where it plays... This card, the other Noxian card that's kind of meme that does stuff at the end of the turn where it like fights things if you've targeted it. Um, and maybe do like a Targon package with it with uh, Aphilios and just try to generate as many weapons between the two of them as possible to keep targeting my things. I think it's going to be a pretty meme deck though. Um, and even if it ends up being slightly better than meme, I don't think it's going to, I don't think it's going to hit anything that's like an A or S tier deck. Um, so I'm going to reluctantly give this card two stars because it has some fringe uses in some decks as an extra threat. Okay, so here we have uh, Ruined Reckoner. This is a Noxious card. I am very impressed with, though. I think that this Noxious card is going to, um, is going to be insane. I think it's going to see play in almost every deck with Noxious. So, uh... If that wasn't spoiler enough before I even get too into it, um, I'm giving this card a uh, a four-star review, and it's on the cusp of five-star. I honestly think that this is quite possibly an auto-include for Noxious, but because it costs four mana and there are some Noxious decks, that four mana is their finisher, uh, and like Spiders, where you just want to win on four and five mana, and this doesn't win you the game, it just buys you tempo, I'm going to give it the four-star review instead of the five-star review. If there weren't this, like, spider aggro type archetype, though, I think that this would be a straight auto-include. And spiders may even still play this. I just think that it actually slows the spiders down enough that they will have to evaluate if they are willing to take a little bit more consistency on board control in exchange for slowing themselves down. So let's get into why I'm giving it those stars, though, because I haven't actually talked about the card much. It is a uh, four-cost, four-three which is a reasonable stat line. It's, it's, you know, a little weaker than some of the more overtuned cards in the game because there are four threes for three that have things like Fearsome. You know exactly what I'm talking about if you've played against Ruma. There's, uh, <laughs> um, but this notably, when summoned, and once again, this is a when summoned, uh, not a when played. So if this gets cheated out, if this gets copied, um, if this... Does anything that puts a copy into play, essentially, you will get this effect. Which means you could hypothetically play a deck using um, Ionia with it and using the card I was discussing for that uh, that cloud unit. And um, he's another great target. You make extra copies, you get these extra midnight raids. Because what he makes is this free spell. It is slow speed, but it's free. And it lets an ally start a free attack. That is massive for a couple of reasons. Reason, num reason number one is that this is basically a four-drop re potential removal spell. Um, except that it also has a body. But it's a free attack. So, if you play it with Misfortune, you're, you're helping level your Misfortune. If you play it with Jarvin and your attacker survives, it helps level Jarvin. If you're playing it with Quinn, you can help level Quinn. Um, it helps level uh, Irelia, not that Irelia particularly, it needs the help, but like there are a ton of stuff. And keep in mind, you could play this in a uh, like a noxious Irelia deck and you could have um, some crazy Mentor of the Meek that just got buffed by a bunch of swords using spell mana play this Ruin Reckoner, give that Mentor of the Meek a free attack, and um, kill a unit and still have a Mentor of the Meek in play. Notably, too, you could play a Irelia uh, Riven deck, and you'd be able to do things like give Mentor of the Meek Overwhelm quite easily, and a free attack with an Overwhelm Mentor of the Meek that's even got an okay number of buffs seems absolutely devastating. Um when we get more into deck theory crafting, that's one of the things I'll be looking at is a, uh, I really a deck that plays Noxious instead of Shruma. I think we finally found a new, a new pairing that might be worth it for Irelia, even though you'd have a, a slower level up with her. Um, but yeah, so the important thing here is that free attack matters so much more because it means if you have quick attack, 
you're just removing the unit. You aren't um, you aren't trading. If you have overwhelm, you can get damage across. If you have uh, barrier, like there are a whole bunch of different interactions that go with free attack. Not to mention that there are units that care about attacking both uh, champions and uh, just. Uh, units themselves that do things when something attacks or um you can combine this with scout and if you combine this with scout that will actually rally you um because anything that gives scout an attack will trigger the scout ability of ready your attack token if it's the first time you've attacked with only scout units in a turn which means on your opponent's turn you could play the ruin reckoner play a midnight raid on a scout unit and rally um that will be something for a different dark, uh, deck type, but Rune Runner is going to enable a lot of archetypes. Um, it is a absolute four-star card, and it is Teeter Gun 5. I'm considering labeling it 5 because it can enable so many things, like the rally I'm talking about, or uh, like help Jarvan out, and so on and so forth. But part of that is yet to be seen because we really have to kind of feel out how Noxious is going to inter out act with the decks that it may not be seeing as much play with right now uh especially because noxious often likes to be very aggressive um you're looking at a different type of noxious package which is refreshing but it changes enough that i can't i can't accurately determine how strong it will be before i play it um this could go up to five though it really really depends on if uh these mid-range noxious cards can find a home in the uh, in the decks that this card is going to want to be in um but even in noxious it's going to be really strong if the noxious deck isn't too fast of an aggro deck and still considered for those faster aggro decks this next card is defective swap bot uh this is a pnz four drop four three Swap my stats with another unit. Okay, so on the note of this card, <laughs> it can be used two different ways. I guess technically three different ways. So you can use it defensively to make a big unit smaller and give yourself a bigger unit. So it's kind of offensive, but you're really doing it to take away from your opponent's stats. Um, you can use this to heal a unit of your own if it's lower than the three health you'd be swapping into. Or you can use this to give a little bit more stats to something that might be annoying to deal with, like an elusive unit or something with quick attack. Uh, I think this card will see a little bit of play. I don't think it's an auto-include, and I don't think there's an archetype at this time that necessarily wants it super hard. Uh, obviously, hybrid digger turrets is a good example of something you could play this to buff the turret. Um, you could turn like a tough turret into a 4-3, which could actually be pretty annoying to fight. Um, or, you know, the fearsome one, give it a little bit more health, a little bit more attack. Um, but the higher cost the turret is, the more diminishing the value of this is because you give up their attack stats for the health stat. But it, it does have a place there. Um, I think this is more likely to see play if um, enough like I cheat out big stuff decks is being used in the format as just a defensive card that is able to protect you. Notably, it won't really save you from an Otacon though. So if Otacon is the thing that people are cheating out, this card isn't gonna be good enough because it'll take a little bit of stats from the Otacon, but the Otacon will still likely kill you with the Overwhelm the turn it comes down, even though it has the three health. So unless you can follow this up with a removal spell on the Otacon, um, it won't answer that deck often enough. Uh, I'm gonna give this card a three-star review, though, because it's not unplayable, and it's not quite to the point where I would consider it a meme card. Um, this is completely format-dependent. This is a two-star card in a format where there's nothing but aggro and mid-range, and then it's a three to a four-star card if there's a whole lot of big things coming down. Um, right now, at least before these cards come out, the, the formats felt pretty healthy. Um, I'll occasionally fight like a marathon of um, pirate aggro or um, lurk. But I've seen a lot of different decks of different um, speeds and typing come out. So really it's going to depend on what gets kind of cemented in as the boogeyman of the format. If it's something that's just like, here's big scary unit, one, two, and three, this card is going to be amazing. If, and if it's, here's 
I kill you on turn five aggro, this card's not going to see any play. Um, so I'm not I'm not going to do half stars because I think half stars a little bit just too uh, disingenuine. I'm just going to have to full commit on a two or a three star review. I'm giving it three star uh, because I anticipate at least one big deck being good enough that this card might see play as a one or two of to deal with that big deck if the deck you're playing it in can't deal with that big deck, uh, that big unit reliably in another way. It's going to be a really good card for your bad matchups, essentially. Um, and like I said, you might have some cool little uh, meme combo you want to combine it, you, you, you might want to combine it with. Um, I don't see it being used to empower your own units very often, though, unless you want to notably play it in, like, an Ionia hand buff deck and buff this thing a bunch in your hand and then use this as a very flexible anything I draw gets all those hand buffs. You could kind of aggressively mulligan for this in hand buff cards instead of whatever you need to buff. Um, the trade the trade-off of doing that being that it would no longer function to hurt your opponent and only to help your units. Uh, so... Giving it three stars, um, but those three stars are definitely contingent on what the format looks like. We have Thrumming Swarm. So Thrumming Swarm is a uh, seven cost, eight four Overwhelm. So obviously the four health, not great. The eight, uh, the eight attack with Overwhelm is, it is, you know, scary enough you can win games with it. But the notable thing is, is that when this is summoned, you create a copy of it in your hand if you've leveled a champion this game. This might see play in some type of controlling deck as just a uh, consistent finisher you can keep recurring over and over and over. If it does see play in a deck like that, it's going to see play as like a one or two of. It's not going to be a three of because it will be really clunky in your hand unless you just happen to be playing a deck that can toss it back through various re uh, means. I will point out though, it's in Shruma. Shruma tends to play quite aggressive units that are just more aggressive on curve. And I am concerned that this is too slow for the region it's in. If this were in a region that's more known for being controlling, like Shadow Isles or Freljord, my opinion on it would increase, but because Shruma, with the exception of the um, the Thresh Nash's style of play, doesn't really combo with with Shadow Isles in a very meaningful way. Like you're doing, you're combining with Shadow Isles for Slay. You're not doing it for necessarily like long play and field wipe type stuff. Um, and then Freljord, um, I rarely use with Shruma, and if I do, I'm more doing it to play like the overshad units of Shruma, not something like this. Uh, this could still see played in like a over uh, overwhelm Freljord Shruma type deck. Um, as a whole, though, I think that this card is going to be a two star card. I think that it can find a home, but the deck it's going to find a home in, if it does, is one that really doesn't exist yet because. Shruma, right now, the only thing I've seen that Shruma control is the kind of predict deck that has Kahiris. And in that deck, I don't think you can make room for the Thrumming Swarm because the Kahiris um, are already consistent enough finishers constantly going back into your deck and having the Fearsome. And uh, you really have to keep that space for your predict cards and your removal cards. And um, there isn't another Shruma deck right now that I consider controlling enough. I've tried some variants myself and um, had mixed results, and I don't think the mixed results will be fixed by having a consistent 8-4 Overwhelm. Um, so there are there is potential, which is why I'm not giving the one-star card, uh, a one-star review. I don't think this card's unplayable. I just think that the home for this card ha is yet to be seen unless there's something I am tragically overlooking. Um, other factions, maybe I would feel differently, just not this faction. So this is going to be um, this be a little bit longer bit. Um, I'm kind of reviewing these all in one package. Um, I will give Viego's Despair a slightly separate review as well, since it is a card you can put in your deck independently. But then Encroaching Mist is a card that just Viego and some Viego support cards are going to be playing. So those will kind of be reviewed with the Viego more than anything. 
<laughs> so Viego uh, himself, he is a 5-4 for 5 with Fearsome. Um, and special ability is each round, the first time an ally dies, you summon an Encroaching Mist. So Encroaching Mist, uh, notably, is when I'm summoned, grant all allied Viegos and other Encroaching Mists everywhere, plus one, plus one. So these are kind of um, like the other um, Mist cards, the myth ra Mist Wraiths, but um, they empower the champion associated, and then they themselves are a separate Mist, which I think is a good call, because I think if Diego specifically function with Mist Wraiths, he may be over to, um, which we'll get into. Um, so, at a glance, he's a 5-4 with Fearsome that doesn't do anything when you play him. Um, he's just an okay stat line for five. Uh, if you just compare that information to what we already know about um, how the game's been played, you probably think that this is a bad card. But we're going to kind of get into how Viego, um, the way he levels and his support cards and stuff, it's going to be opening up a new archetype, and I think that he's actually going to be strong enough to see play uh, as the champion for a couple of different versions of his own deck, basically. Uh, I think he's actually actually significantly stronger than he looks at a glance, despite the fact that the level up condition, which we're just now discussing, he's seen, he's seen allies with 20 plus total power die, which is, ooh, sounds pricey. Um... But let's, let's get into this a little bit, okay? Um, and we're going to get into a lot more on the deck building thing. But let's just get into it with Viego himself. Viego. Let's say, you know, you, you chump block a thing the turn you play it. You get this 1-1. One, one. This 1-1's one, going to die. Your Viego is already bigger because you got this 1-1. One, one. He is now... Slightly above curve for a champion you play on 5, because a 6-5 five for 5 isn't bad. You've gained the stats of whatever you trump block with, plus this 1-1, one, one, uh, as far as uh, the 20 total power that you've needed to die. You've already progressed plus however many. Let's say you had, like, you know, a 2 or 3 attack you didn't play, which is unreasonable to expect to have at that point in the game. You probably even blocked with more units. You also have to keep in mind that if your opponent can't just swing for the game or do something to remove your Viego, having this out while you have a field of blockers may actually result in your opponent saying, I don't want to attack, because leveled Viego says, each round, the first time a unit dies, you once again summon an approaching mist at round start, which means if your opponent swings out with a board, kills all your blockers and you're actually level Viego off of it, which is hypothetically possible depending on what your board looks like, you'll already get to do this effect once. And the round start is so you steal the strongest enemy. It's always the strongest. If that enemy is the champion, you kill it instead. That is actually a win condition. That is a fair level requirement for that win condition because it is such a potent effect. Um, once again, I know I looked a lot to the side here, sorry. The cards are here, not here for me, even though the way you're seeing it, it looks like they're here. And there was a lot more to decompress on that particular card. Um, but yes, yeah, so there's a... That effect wins you a game. Let's just, you know, imagine that that effect is too hard for you to do consistently. Your Viego is still getting bigger every time... An encroaching mist comes down. Those encroaching mists are getting more and more dangerous. Those encroaching mists are leveling Viego faster because they are bigger. Uh, but Viego himself is becoming a bigger and bigger threat, and it's granting him that stat boost everywhere. So the next copy of Viego you play may be a, you know, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10 attack unit. Um, people remember Thresh Nasus and... Think of how scary a 10 attack fearsome unit is. It can be really hard to answer. Viego can be that. And it's not actually insane to get Viego to that pretty quickly. 
even without um, leveling him. Vigo's champion spell is Vigo's Despair. Uh, you pick a unit to strike your ne nexus and then kill it. So this is kind of a reverse atrocity. You can use this on your own units as a leveling thing for Viego, which I do have a cool combo. I will uh, I will be pointing out uh, when I get to the deck building portion, but not during the reviewing of this card. Um, but even just, this is a reverse atrocity. That is essentially a low mana curve hard removal that you are paying life to make up for it. I think that actually makes the card fairly playable. In addition to that, I think that adds value to Viego because it lets you play more Viego's Despairs. Will you necessarily play Viego's Despair in every deck? No. Um, you're going to want to be able to heal or uh, frostbite and that kind of thing. But think about it. If you're playing this in a combo deck with, or not combo deck, but just a control deck with Freljord, you can frostbite your opponent's unit, hit it with a Despair or Viego's Despair if you have Viego in play specifically, and kill a unit in exchange for frostbiting them plus the card. You do not take damage because their attack is zero. So their strike is zero. Um, notably, Frost Maiden will just frostbite their strongest enemy for you every round. Now you can go I Frost Maiden on five. <laughs> Following turn, you start your turn. And I'm just going to kill the thing at Frostbit. Just, just get rid of it. Um, that is actually insane. Um, Diego, right now I'm going to give a three-star review on. It's possible that once we get into the deck building and stuff, I might be like, actually, the more I think about it, he's a four-star. For now, I think I'm going to rate Viego three stars. I think Viego is very playable. I think Viego is going to potentially um, be a great card in a controlling archetype, um, either with Freljord or with Demacia, like mid-range dragon type thing. But I also think there's one other bundle where you kind of just do a, um, a self-sacrifice build that I'm going to kind of get into. I kind of see three different potential decks for the Viego, and I'm kind of interested to talk about them a little bit later. Despair, I'm going to give a uh, four-star review to. I think that Despair is actually insanely playable. I don't think you're going to play this as a three of in all of the decks, but if you're paired with Frostbite, you're going to want more copies of this than not. And even in a deck that is not playing Frostbite or any... Uh, or giving you any means to uh, lower stats, you will happily take a strike from a win condition unit to kill that unit, especially if that unit was going to hit you anyways. Uh, some examples, Ezreal. Yes, you're going to give the, uh, the Ezreal a, uh, a Mystic Shot. But if that Ezreal was going to hit you that turn, even if you did not remove it, they were still going to get that Mystic Shot and they were still going to get that Ezreal hit, but they would have still had the Ezreal in play. So, uh, there are plenty of low attack champions. This is going to feel really strong against. It will feel a little bit worse against some of those because a lot of the lower attack champions are rewarded for striking your opponent. Um, like Teemo will get the Mushrooms. Um... You know, uh, Zoe will get you the card or the discount if you already have it. Things like that. But, despite this being slow speed, which is normally kind of um, a death sentence for a spell in this game, I think this card is insanely playable. Uh, as Like, a one-of as a minimum, because a lot of decks where I kind of throw a one-of um, removal spell in my deck, I have it for what if they play, like, a unit I just can't get out of my way before I win the game, or what if they play a unit that will win them the game in two turns, that kind of thing. And Viego's Despair is going to feel really, really good about against those things. There are a couple things you're really not going to want to use it on because they're just so big, um, but there are so many champions, especially in the game, that you would be very happy to take a singular hit from to say you don't get that champion anymore. And um, that's a big deal. I will... Stipulate that if Lurk is too popular, this card gets worse because everything in Lurk will strike really hard unless you use this very early. But, as a whole, I think this card is going to see play as a 1-3 to three of in most decks that are playing this region. And um, 
if they are playing Freljord, I think that it is an auto three of. Unless that Freljord combination is not using Frostbite for some reason, but it's pretty rare to combine the two factions and not run Frostbite. Um, so very, very strong. I am I'm quite excited to see how uh, that card goes. So we do have two more cards that enable Viego. This is very relevant, especially because Camavoran Soldier is cheap enough you will be playing this before you play Viego. And that's going to make your Viego a bigger threat more often. And that is so, so important. So, Camavoran Soldier. 3-3 three, three for 3. Already completely reasonable stat line. Uh, when I'm Summon, Summon an Encroaching Mist. Once again, this is a when I'm summoned effect. You copy this unit, get cheated into play any of those things, you'll still get the effect. Probably not cheating this unit specifically, but just drawing your attention to it does synergize with those things, and it's something that does not go on the stack. It summons an encroaching mist. Let's say you have a pretty bad draw and you only hit one of these in the game before your Viego. You're still going to be saying your Viego is plus one, plus one stronger than um printed stats when you play uh like when you're playing it plus then getting another plus one plus one from its encroaching mist assuming you're able to trigger uh a death the turn you play it so that's already a plus two plus two also your encroaching mist that you're summoning with him is already adding a little bit more value to the level up because it's bigger and that's a bad draw a better draw is you're hitting these early in the game you're playing these before you play your viego and your viego and your uh, is going to come down and actually be a fairly scary threat and the encroaching mists that it summons are going to be scary in the first place uh this card is absolutely fantastic i'm gonna slide these up to make stars actually fit i didn't think about the fact i might have to you know fit things into uh my post edit it's, whoopsie i i can always make some modifications later if i have if i have to so anyways um absolutely crazy um it is niche because it only really is going to see play with viego you might Play it in some Mist Wraith deck that just uses some extra extra type of Mist cards and just these two cards. But I feel like if you're playing these, you are playing Viego, even if you're trying to play that like Mist version of the deck. Um, and with that being said, I'm going to give this card three stars. It's not going to fit in everything from the region, but it is going to fit in fantastically when you're playing Viego. And I think most Viego decks are really going to want to find room for this, if not all Viego decks. Uh, invasive Hydrovine, Fearsome, 7-6. Uh, already actually a pretty dangerous unit with those stat lines. It has, when I'm summoned or round start, you summon an Encroaching Mist. I think this is a four-star card. And this is why. Uh, this card is a finisher for Viego. It is... A card that must be removed if you don't want to just lose the game to longevity because every time it triggers, it's more dangerous than the time before. It is consistent leveling for Viego because of that um, encroaching growth. It is arguably a higher removal threat than Viego, at least if they're both in play and Viego is not leveled or close to leveling. But by removing it, you're putting Viego almost 50% of the way to leveling. Viego out plus that out. You start the round, you get a mist. Your Viego is bigger and you have a mist. You swing with the mist. Viego makes another mist because that mist is going to die. And um, you are leveling so insanely fast. Uh, that card is... An auto include for Viego decks, in my opinion, and lesser Viego deck for some reasons, an aggressive Viego deck. But I think Viego decks are going to organically fall into a controlling deck. I don't think it's going to logically make sense to play Viego as a finisher at the end of an aggro list. It's going to be a uh, finisher slash supporting card in control decks. Uh, the reason I'm giving this card the four star treatment, though, is because this card has a good enough stat line to just be a finisher in decks with an upside of I give you an extra attacker or a chump blocker 
every round and those blockers and attackers get progressively more dangerous you could play this as a top end finisher in a control list with nothing else in the mist package just saying i play a lot of removal a 7-6 fearsome is devastating in a lot of matchups and i'm getting extra value from this card and it would still be worth playing um obviously the card has higher value if you're using other things that make encroaching mists because it makes it more dangerous up front but it is dangerous enough on the turn you play it without any supporting cards that it is insanely powerful if you are playing it in a control list so this is a four star rating for it but this is a four star rating on the caveat of control lists for a non-control list it's a two star card um because you're not playing seven drops in control in non-control decks um very often if you are you're playing like a top end thing and a mid-range deck but you won't get a long 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 uh longevity uh or long-term value or anything like that from it in a mid-range deck or an aggro deck so two stars if you're playing aggro or mid-range four stars when you're playing control but because this card is designed for control, I'm reviewing it as if it were going into its proper home, and I'm giving it four stars. Absolutely insane. Um, arguably even even like more consistent. We have Withering Mist. So it's another slow speed spell, which is interesting um, that they're kind of pushing slow speed more. I think it's smart game design, if they don't want too much power creep, to put stronger effects on slow and make people choose between slightly weaker effects that have more flexibility or slightly stronger effects with less flexibility as a kind of a teeter-totter um, design space for power there will still be power creep at some point in the card game the nature of the beast but it's a good design plan to um to stay off the the power creep for as long as possible so five mana drain two from two enemies Basically, five mana, deal four. But it's drain, which means it's deal four, heal four. Obviously, if there aren't enough targets, this card isn't as good. But drain can be insanely powerful. Um, Grasp is a great card. It's fast speed, obviously, so it has a little more flexibility, and it drains three. Uh, which makes it slightly stronger removal on a single target, but weaker, obviously, in aggro matchups. This card is two to three stars depending on the metagame if if control is too prevalent i don't think this card will see much play if aggro and mid-range are prevalent enough this card is going to be fantastic this card is so strong against lurk it's insane you also could play this with a bilge water package do some powder kegs and drain higher damage numbers to heal for more and uh drain for more uh, there is a chance the Ego decks will play this to try to heal themselves to make up for, um, for some of the other cards that can kind of enable the Ego, um, by, like, killing your own units and things like that, but I don't actually think that's where this is going to find home. This is, uh, if it finds home with the Ego, it's going to do it to remove your opponent's things more often than you um, than recover from hurting yourself. Um... At this time, I'm giving this a three-star review. If the format shifts to a more controlling format, this goes down to a two-star review. Uh, but based on the frequency I've seen low health aggressive decks, at this time, um, without knowing what the format will look like in the next couple of weeks, this card is actually quite strong. You probably won't play it as more than a one or two of in the decks that want it because of it being slow. Uh, but if you end up having the space, especially to fill out the mana curve, you're going to really appreciate having this card. It's going to feel really, really good when you remove two units and heal for four. It's going to feel really, really bad when you match up against a deck that has nothing but big things or doesn't play very many units and you do nothing with it and it sits in your hand. So... We have this whole nifty package here. So we have, um, what's really cool about this package, um, is there's this cool symmetry where it goes two drop, three drop, four drop. 
and then six drop. <laughs> Obviously, you could curve in the V8 go on five, though. Um, but it also has a synergy of going um, Shadow Isle, Dimasha, Shadow Isle, Dimasha, which I think was probably intentional design-wise. Um, these cards are quite aggressive um, dragons. They have some downside to them, but there are going to be some cool ways of benefiting from them with Viego. Um, some of which I'll go over here in this review, but some of them I'm going to kind of save for the deck tech talk because not all of it is newer cards. I'm trying to keep as much conversation on what these are on um, more the vacuum of new cards than everything in the game. But anyway, we, we have a 3-2. Uh, Crawling Viperworm, Fury, for 2. Play, I strike an ally or deal 3 to your Nexus. So... Quite notably, this is a dragon that you can curve out on two immediately after playing Dragon Chow. I do not know how the interaction will work with Dragon Chow if you can choose to strike the Dragon Chow and then the Dragon Chow's effect will just go off and kind of like eat the strike anyway, uh, or if it'll force you to deal the three. Uh, that's yet to be determined. I Hypothetically raw, I think what will happen is when you play it, it tells you pick a thing and you'll pick, and then after you pick, the Dragon Chow resolves. So I think Hypothetically, you can say strike, and then Dragon Chow will still just be struck and um, draw you your card and give this, you know, its Fury Trigger. Um, I hope that's how it works, at least. Seems how it reads, but um, super duper strong if you're playing Dimasha and going Dimash and Dragons. Being able to get a 4-3 Dragon out and a card draw when you have your Dragon Chow is great. Uh, obviously, doing 3 to your own Nexus can be a bit difficult to... Uh, to muster, but if you um, play any campy strategies of like units that want to die, um, or or you have a unit that has ephemeral already, such as uh, the mist that you'll be summoning, uh, these kills become a lot more reasonable for you to do because they're gonna die anyways, or the strikes, because they're not always gonna be kills. Um, then you have Ruined Dragon Guard. This card is going to be an auto-include in Shivana decks because it's already in Dimasha, so they aren't um, they aren't giving up a faction slot in order to play it. Um, and I think and I do think there will be at least one deck that is doing um, this specific lineup of dragons using Shivana, and potentially still using Viego, potentially not. We will see in that regard. Um, so we have the Ruined Dragon Guard, which is when an ally with Fury kills a unit, you grant it an additional plus one, plus one. That is absolutely insane, especially because your dragons could kill your own units. And now the value of killing your own units has gone up in stock because now when you kill your own unit, you could be getting plus two, plus two for it instead of plus one, plus one for it. And if you're playing it with synergy cards that do things when they die, or when they're struck, or anything along those lines, um, you're getting extra value. Then we have a uh, Camavorian Dragon, which is a fearsome dragon, 4-3, also Fury, um, which at this point, if it's a dragon, it, it has to have Fury. That's kind of just like their thing. I haven't seen a Calm Dragon yet in the game, and I'd be a little bit surprised if one came around unless it had a, like a new uh, effect that made sense that was like, Different than Fury for why it's calm, you know? Uh, but at this time, kind of just assume if it's a dragon, it's going to have Fury in this game. Uh, when you play it, it once again will strike an ally or deal three damage to the Nexus. It's kind of just what these corrupted dragons do. They either hurt your Nexus or they uh, they hurt an ally. Uh, when it slays a unit, you drain one from the enemy Nexus. So this is one of those perfect examples of you, you're getting an extra upside. You can kill like a 1-1 one -one you have in play, drain one from your opponent, Give this thing plus two, plus two if you already have a Ruined Dragon Guard in play. And then have a Fearsome 6-5 on four, which is super scary. And even if your opponent can block it, uh, it's getting bigger and is draining every time that they don't kill it. It's just snowballing. This card could uh, be dangerous enough to justify playing Dragons without Shivana just because it fills that four slot. And I'm not saying Shivana's bad. I'm just saying... Um, Depending on how much you want your curb to round out and how top end you want to go, it could be getting harder and harder to fit champion dragons into your deck if you're trying to play a hyper aggressive dragon deck instead of a more controlling dragon deck. Um, and then we have 
Kadrigan the Ruined uh, is 6-6 six, six for 6. Uh, also, Damasha, like I said, they rotate. Uh, Fury, Grant an Allied Champion or Dragon. Challenger. Absolutely fantastic effect. Uh, obviously, it won't always go off, but a 6-6 six, six Dragon um, on 6 is completely reasonable. Um, I think that of the cards we see here, this is the weakest card in the set, specifically because... Um, it does not have an impact on an empty board. Um, and when I say empty board, I mean if you have nothing and you play it, its impact is you have a unit. Because it's not going to target itself, I don't believe. I might be wrong on that. It might be able to target itself. If it can target itself, it's better. Um, I think that this is a... Uh, a ooh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to... Hot take here. I'm going to give it two stars. I think that there are enough early aggression dragons in the game it's going to be really really hard to want to fit in the six drop um you might give it a little bit more stock if you play like a dragon control list using viego uh but i think that dragon control list would be better off playing other supporting removal if you were doing that and that this card is just a little too clunky on its cost for either a control list or a mid-range list, because you can have these higher impact things like your challenging dragons on five um, before you play this card entirely, and these other ones that they're introducing are these like super aggressive earlier game cards that are really encouraging you to go faster than what this card is doing. Uh, might see plays a one or two of. I might be completely wrong giving this a card a two star review, but I think the way that dragons like to play, um, if you're controlling, I think this card isn't consistent enough, and if you're mid range, I think this card's too slow. So two stars for this card, and I know I didn't go left to right. I just kind of went stream of consciousness here, and I think that um, that was the one I had the most immediate thoughts on. Crawling Viper Worm. Um, I will give three stars to. I think it's going to be very good in dragons. I think it might be good in a deck that cares about killing its own units. Actually, you know what? I'm going to give this four stars. I'm changing this to a four star review because I'm thinking about like, like Thresh Nasus could actually play this card as a, uh, as a slight engine. Um with stuff that they already like to kill and get value off of killing. And uh, it is a higher threat target that grows. I will give this a four star review actually because it fits into dragons and the slay archetype um, and potentially some Viego deck that isn't pure dragons but wants a little bit more um, toolkit stuff. So I think this card will fit into enough different archetypes that we can kind of consider, consider it an auto include in a lot of spots. Uh, if, for whatever reason, those archetypes of, like, hurt your own stuff isn't good enough, the card won't be good enough, and the value will be lower than what I get it at four stars. Uh, Ruin Dragon Guard is absolutely a four-star card. You're only going to play it with dragons, but it will be an auto-include. And any dragon list that's playing Dimasha, and at this time, yes, you could play, like, a Targon... Um, and you you could play Targon with this uh, with these instead and cut out the Damasha cards, but you have more good dragons in Damasha than anywhere else. And obviously this is a Damashian unit, um, which is giving you more reason to keep playing Damasha while playing dragons. I don't think there is a world where there is a good enough dragon deck that is not playing Damasha. So because of that, this is four stars. Um, if you want to play a dragon deck at its highest tier, it can exist at, you will be, you will be playing Ruin Dragon Guard. You will be playing Damasha. You may not be playing every dragon in Damasha, you may, but you will be playing Ruin Dragon Guard basically 100% of the time. Uh, Gamavorian Dragon, I am going to give a, um, three star two. Uh, while this functionally fits in like the Crawling Viper Worm in a Slay deck, 
and has the added scare factor of that drain effect. It is a four, a four drop card, which means it's going to fit in really well in dragons, uh, and a lot of dragon decks and decks that want to slay their units will still be happy to play this, but this will not be an auto include in all of them because it's a steeper curve and it's more competitive and you're looking at, do I, you know, play this card, uh, drain one from my enemy and uh, get a, a kind of dangerous unit in play, or do I play a 4-1 and draw two cards for slaying my unit? And uh, a lot of the time, keeping that gas is going to be higher value to you than that threat of draining. Uh, there will be decks that this could even be the wooden condition of, where this card may go up in stock a bit. But I don't think this is quite the auto-include in the archetype the way that the Crawling Viper Worm will be, because it's comp competing with so many things at that mana slot that um, do similar or different things that are just as or more important. Uh, we already went over the how I feel about the particular dragon here. Uh, not quite good enough. 